who's included and who has been left to the side, questions of equity, questions of fairness, and questions of uh, the fundamental treatment of how we relate to one another in society, uh, not only the people that, uh, you know, looking around at all the familiar faces on this screen, but also about um, the people who are unknown to us, people who could very easily become statistics in a newspaper, um, and questions of what are our responsibilities of justice to those people who uh, not only are people who we don't know personally, but who are in many cases very far from our immediate lives. Um, and so it is our privilege this morning to welcome Bob Lankin as a guest darshan. Uh, Bob is a member of Beth Shalom Congregation in Elkins Park, who serves as the volunteer coordinator for the Jewish congregation at the State Correctional Institution at Greaterford. Uh, for the past 35 years. Bob has been an advocate for Jewish returning citizens and has spoken out against mass incarceration. Uh, and Bob will uh, be our guest Darshan this morning. Thank you, Bob. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Thank you for the opportunity to address this holy congregation on Shabbat Shoftim. The Torah teaches us in this week's Sidra, Sedek, Sedek, Tir Dof. Justice, justice, shall you pursue. We now have a criminal justice system that is powerfully unjust. Somehow, the United States of America 30 years ago decided to choose the wrong path. This path caused a major adverse effects on our entire society. No one woke up one morning saying that they wanted to increase the number of imprisoned people from 502,000 in 1980 to 2.2 million in 2020, but that's exactly what happened. We are 4% of the world's population and 20, we represent 25% of the world's incarcerated population. In Canada, there are 40,000 people incarcerated, about 139 for each 100,000 of population. In Great Britain, 84,000 incarcerated people, about 173 per 100,000. In the United States, we have around 650 people per 100,000 incarcerated. We are the most incarcerated society in world history. This immense number of incarcerated people comes with immense costs. It is estimated that in Pennsylvania, we are spending over $5 billion to incarcerate over 80,000 people. In the United States, we're spending over $81 billion every year. This immense concentration of caged individuals <clears throat> has had a major repugnant impact on our families, our communities, and our nation. The insidious introduction of mass incarceration has led to more crime and more violence. By removing hundreds of thousands of mostly men from poor communities, we have impoverished hundreds and thousands of families, holding back millions of children who do not have access to their dads and sometimes their moms. <clears throat> Our politicians have told us and convinced us that we need this unconscionable degree of incarceration for us to remain safe. People have been convinced to vote for people who are tough on crime by dishing out excessively long sentences. The prison industrial pop complex contains the people and industries that make lots of money from in excessive incarceration. These include companies that run private prisons for pro and profit from them, companies that build prisons, companies that sell supplies to prisons, and people who work at prisons. It also includes companies that provide expensive telephone services and firms that handle the money that people send to their loved ones' canteen accounts. These powerful financial interests fund the politicians who tell you that only harsh punishments and longer sentences will keep you safe. However, social scientists and criminologists have been telling us for years that excessive punishment does not deter crime. After a 40-year bout of mass incarceration, we
we've had dozens of shootings in Philadelphia on most summer weekends. There will be those who say that we need even harsher penalties to stop the shootings. We need you to point out that the antidote for our crime problem is education, not incarceration. Only by investing our resources into a better society and better schools, instead of building more and more prisons, will we be able to get our crime population under control. The mass incarceration of our citizens have had a devastating effect on our African-American community. African-Americans are incarcerated at nearly five times the rate of whites. One prominent author, Professor Michelle Alexander, in her widely heralded book, The New Jim Crow, makes the case that mass incarceration intentionally or actually replaces the evil Jim Crow laws in persecuting black Americans. Let me now share some insights from Jewish tradition on the subject. Much of the research that I am going to tell you about is taken from a book called Crime and Consequence, written by Rabbi Shmuel Super and published by the Jewish Learning Institute in 2018. This book, this uh, publishing company is part of the Chabad and they have been giving uh, uh, programs all over the world on all kinds of Jewish subjects. And they're not particularly well known for progressive opinions. But uh, this course, Crime and Consequence, that I took two years ago, uh, has a lot of information about Jewish sources. The problem with trying to discern a clear message from Judaism about mass incarceration is that the body of Jewish writings were written over 3,000 years. But prisons, as we know them, were only invented in the 19th century. There are three reasons to put someone in prison, to separate them from society and protect society from further crimes, to punish the person and thereby discourage other from committing crimes, and to effectuate retribution. I understand that and accept that criminals who are willing and capable of committing further crimes should be separated from society for a reasonable amount of time and be punished for that for the crime they have committed. However, it is clear to me that Jewish teachings are against incarceration for the purpose of retribution. We are effectuating retribution when we keep a person incarcerated after most reasonable people consider the person sufficiently punished and all reasonable facts concerning that prisoner indicates a low risk of his committing more crimes. Retribution results in excessive incarceration. I will explain. The issue with what is appropriate punishment for a criminal under Jewish law must first start with the Jewish law found in the Torah. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and God created man in his image. Therefore, people are to be treated as special and holy as God would be. To excessively incarcerate a person who is in the image of God is a violation of Jewish law. The only way to advocate for retribution as part of the sentence is to forget the Torah's requirement to pursue justice. Judaism teaches us to treat people fairly and properly. Incarcerating someone past what is necessary to reasonably punish the person for his crimes and to protect society from that person is unjust and violates Jewish law. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin in his book, Jewish Literacy stated, because it believes that each human being is created in God's image, the Torah regards every person as possessing infinite and individual value. According to crime and consequence, Jewish law tolerates prisons only when absolutely necessary to protect society. There are several principles of Jewish law which our current system of mass incarceration violates. The first principle is explained by the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. The Rebbe, considered one of the most influential Jewish leaders in the 20th century, having lived in the 20th century, he was in a position to talk about mass incarceration. He stated, man was created in the divine image and was born to toil, that's what it says in Job, and to serve his creator, and that's from the Talmud, Kedushin. Man was not created to be idle, but to work and achieve positive things, to serve his creator in holy and spiritual pursuits. Excessive incarceration keeps too many people idle.
I, I lost my screen, but that's okay if you can still hear me. Um, this, when placing a person in prison is denied the ability to do anything. Placing a living person in a prison and denying them the ability to fulfill their life mission is contrary to the Torah of kindness. This is cruel and does not benefit anyone. Torah can only have punishments that do not interfere with man's ability to achieve his divine mission. Jewish tradition teaches us that everything in this universe was created by God with a positive purpose to be utilized completely without waste. Accordingly, in the criminal justice system, punishment should affect direct results and benefits for all parties involved, the perpetrator, the victim, and society in general. For the victim and society, punishment must serve goals such as restitution, deterrence, and protection. Excessive imprisonment does not serve these functions. It certainly brings no benefit short-term or long-term to the victim. It is questionable just how much it benefits society, and it obviously does no good for the inmate. On the contrary, prison limits and inhibits a person's potential, destroys families and breeds bitterness, anger, insensitivity, and eventually recidivism. A person is understood in the Jewish tradition to play a central role in fulfilling God's creation, charged with making the world into a dwelling place for the Almighty God, and using each of his moments to accomplish this purpose by serving his maker. Accordingly, a human being must use all resources to fulfill this obligation. Excessive imprisonment inherently limits a person's mobility and ability to function. Accordingly, it appears inconsistent for God to charge a person with obligations and at the same time prevent him from fulfilling them. One other important issue, excessive imprisonment costs a fortune. When we keep a person incarcerated after most reasonable people would consider a person sufficiently punished and all reasonable facts concerning that prisoner indicates a low risk of his committing more crimes, this wastes com precious community resources. This waste is a violation of Jewish law. Imagine if our society spent the billions of dollars that we spend on prisons on improving education, which studies have shown significantly lowers the chances that an individual will commit crimes, lowering our incarceration rate. Next, I would like to address Jewish law and capital punishment. Jewish law is conflicted on this issue. However, if presented with the facts as applicable in 2020 Pennsylvania, it is my opinion that when observed from a Jewish perspective, capital punishment should be repealed in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has executed 1,043 people since 1693. However, it has imposed the death penalty on only three people since 1976. The present governor has imposed a moratorium on the death penalty during his term. Still, powerful forces prevent its repeal, including the Correctional Officers Labor Union and the District Attorneys Association. When it was recognized that African American prisoners were executed at significantly greater rates than white Americans, many states abolished capital punishment. Around 20 states have now repealed the death penalty, along with all of Western Europe, Australia, and Canada. Why do some states still have capital punishment? The existence of the statute makes it possible for the prosecution to extract longer punishments in plea bargains, excessively long sentences. This is why the death penalty violates Jewish principles. It has resulted in 5,100 people currently serving the sentence of life in prison without parole in Pennsylvania. I will explain what is Jewishly wrong with life in prison without parole. One of the important provisions of Jewish beliefs is that a sinner can commit tshuva and thereby earn God's forgiveness. Sins against another human being need to be addressed with that person. Sins against God need to be addressed to God. Jews world over pray every Yom Kippur to clear their records with the Almighty. We believe that when truly sincere tshuva happens, God will forgive us. There is no room for tshuva with sentences like life without parole and capital punishment. Pennsylvania has the third highest population of all the states who are serving the sentence of life without parole. There are around 50,000 people serving that sentence in the United States. 
They are not allowed to appear before a parole board to tell their story, to discuss the college degrees they earned, to talk about their good deeds since being incarcerated, and to share their true remorse for their crimes. For me, this discussion is not just theoretical. For over 35 years, I have been visiting the Jewish prisoners at Greaterford, now called SCI Phoenix. I have made friends on my visits who are serving this sentence. Some have, been ser have served in excess of 30 years, one over 50 years. Had they committed the original crime in Canada, France, or Germany, they would have been out and would be free citizens long ago. Mass incarceration has been described as one of the important civil rights issue of our time. Fellow Jews have been in the forefront of the civil rights movement. We remember the time when we suffered from discrimination. The famous photo of Rabbi Heschel, a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary, marching with Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama, was a wonderful example of the support Jews have always given to civil rights. The Jewish Council on Public Affairs is the umbrella group of over 125 Jewish Community Relations Councils. <clears throat> it works actively to fight mass incarceration. The Reform Action Center actually has a lobbyist in Washington working on this issue. Chabad gave the course at hundreds of locations on the subject last year. Notwithstanding thousands of people actively working to reverse this unacceptable situation, the powerful economic forces that I mentioned are working to incarcerate even more people. To conclude, my goal this Shabbat is to try to change opinions about the system of mass incarceration, which we have built up over the past 40 years. I shared some Jewish insights about the challenges of mass incarceration, capital punishment, and the sentence of life without parole in our society. All three kinds of punishments are excessive, wasting tremendous communal resources that can be used to improve society, which would lead to a lessening of the need for imprisonment in general. Jewish law decrees waste, encourages tshuva, repentance, and cherishes the life of every human being. These are Jewish values nourished over 3,000 years of which we can be very proud. I conclude with a prayer from our liturgy. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melcham Matir Asurim. Blessed is God who frees the fetter. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, thank you, Bob. It, and thank you for bringing your experience, your expertise, and your learning to share with us this morning. We're going to